the title of the talk is essentials of SAR in outcome based accreditation system. What SAR is? SAR stands for self assessment report. The basic principle of outcome based accreditation is correct and compile some information. Compile your own mind to that information. On the basis of the characteristics and parameters defined by the accreditation agency, assess your own strength and weaknesses. Document them. That is SAR. That's why it is named as self assessment report. In some countries, it is called as self study report. You have studied yourself, your program, which is strength and weaknesses. And therefore, you are arriving at your own decision where you spend. What are your strengths? What are your Likewise, here as we move forward, you will realize that the information which is being compiled to this SAR format, they will have most of the things which can be readily entered on the strength and weakness of the program. This of which the graduate attributes defined by the portion. Then you will ask me a question, why am I getting in this? 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 Why am I and with very big and that conforms to the natural process, principle of the natural process. I, when I am going to assess myself, it will have definitely an element of bias. Certainly I may go, certainly I may appreciate, and they say, of this most of the people are here from the end, I will try to say this. How many of you are giving high support to you? Only never made to run to my car. So it is for the customer to judge, it is for the other to judge that what sort of quality the program has or the product has. So keeping that principle of natural justice in mind, the role of activity in this situation. But most of the work as you will see in the coming slides, this will be done by the system. There is one more dimension behind this approach. The dimension is to enable the institutions to identify their own weaknesses and tackle them at their own. It is a sort of capacity building exercise. That is one of the reasons if you go to the objective of the National Board of Accreditation, it says the prime objective, one of the prime objectives is to facilitate the institutions to move towards attainment of quality and ultimately to move towards education. So this is an accreditation, it is not a regulatory process. Accreditation is a facilitation process. Wherein you are motivated, you are encouraged, you are guided how to elevate quality. The other goal of
So, this is what the basic principle of all from this activity. And why we are calling it as self-assessment tools. This slide is about outcome. I am not going to touch upon it because I have said something about it earlier. And also, one of my colleagues also talked about this uh, outcome at length. This SAR, what is SAR? We already talked. Next. The SAR which is coming now, will have two parts. And before going to this, I would like to clarify one conclusion from this reform. The institutions currently may be in a state of confusion, and I, on behalf of any approval, I say. And we have entry to become permanent member of Washington Accord. They have right in the year 2007. They got the provisional civil status. And from that point onward, they were supposed to man their place, come up with a new system so that they can deal with the Washington Accord bombing. And in that process, a new document was developed and adopted. We call that June 2019. The one on the website of ELMA, the institutions have died, and we are in the process of disposing of these cases. When the NBA came into the present form, an independent body out of the ACPE, the document was again revisited and it was said it's not going to solve any purpose. Part A and Part B. Part 
anche un diritto di forma che ancora una volta istituisce e cosa ti istituisce una riforma eh? details later on in, in the subsequent slide and by the time I hope you may be having a copy of the document with you. The part B of SAR this is the aggregation criteria. These are the essential points which are taken into consideration by making some recommendation about the aggregation of the land. And cross senior people, lot of very experienced people are over here. No one would be better than them to appreciate that there is a change. I am looking here some eminent professors who have been going as chairman and protected in living as chairman, that is, probably or not here in home. Some as evaluator, maybe 30 40 programs. They can appreciate that these are the criteria for missing a moment. Touch upon them in a very casual manner and which is PEOs and PEOs. But what essentially require a vision, mission, program education objectives, program outcomes, program curriculum, mapping between vision and mission, graduate attributes. PEO, program educational objectives, program outcomes, goals outcomes, program specific criteria, assessment, the third criteria is assessment and evaluation of attainment of PEOs and program outcomes. Student performance, faculty contributions, facilities and technical support, teaching learning process, governance, institutional support and financial resources, continuous information. It is not like this. The entire description of the earlier document is this here. Input parameters are very much here. Output parameters are very much here. Which have been used earlier by MBA. In the documents still to make the document What are those? They are governance, institutional support and financial information usefully asked about these 
इस आर्डिया रहता है इसी लर्निंग कॉस्ट कॉस्ट गया फैसिलिटीज एंड टेक्निकल सपोर्ट कॉस्ट गया बट ये फॉर्मेट ऑफ सीकिंग की फॉर्मेशन एंड फॉर्मेट एक्टिवेट की फॉर्मेशन ये भी डिफॉल्ट बट ये कॉस्ट आई मुझे गया स्टूडेंट परफॉर्मेंस कॉस्ट गया बट इफ यू सी द फर्स्ट थ्री बुलेट्स एंड द लास्ट बुलेट लास्ट बुलेट कॉस्ट ऑफ गया एवरीवन शेक ऑफ गया बट the moment i am going to explain to you then you can appreciate it is a totally different context it is not in the context in which we have been doing it now so i will request you to kindly permit me to explain each and everything what we mean by vision here what we mean by vision here what we mean by educational program educational objectives here what we mean by program outcome and program curriculum what the international community believes <coughs> that every institution should have a vision and vision <coughs> i'm sorry i told you my hope is not good as to hear in this uh An institution, whether a university or a college, should have a vision. And usually, every institution has. It's not like that we are talking something out of the box. Every institution has a vision. In what way they want to go, what they want to achieve, and they have a vision. Which gives the futuristic plan. Which gives the glimpse of the futuristic plan of the city. Suppose I am a promoter, I am in the society, I am in the trust, I am in the government, I am the chairman of the institution, I am the board of governors of the institution. Definitely, to be very very clear about the first thing that in what way do you want to take this institution forward in coming decades? That is the reason. That needs to be satisfied. Condition. Why do you have this institution? What we want to achieve by the establishment of the institution, that is the mission. The international community also wants that the department, every department of a particular institution, must have a mission. They should be the institution should have a specific department with a mission. What they want to accomplish by establishing this department. It should not be like this that they are the division department for the sake of the reward, and that is not true. Departments are always the division division. What is it? Just to narrate it. The reward for the mission by the division department. Then you say this is useless. We have in what way is going to continue to be quality of the program. As we move forward, I think I will be able to take a look at that point as B. And the real world of question here is the people are confused. I am not saying you are confused. Please don't take it like this. I am not only talking to you people, I guess I am talking to hundreds of people outside this. That is what I am saying. Program educational objectives. I have gone through a document of Central Board of Secondary Education. Even that document has program educational object in form of course objectives. So this is nothing new. We can think that our university and college they also have a program object, but that has to be documented. What the international community wants? That documentation should not only be in SAR, but for the larger benefit of the students, the larger benefit of the stakeholders, they should have a mechanism to publish them at other places, say on their website, on their catalogs, on their uh, prospectus. That this is the program which we are offering with these objectives: one, two, three, four, five, six. I will give you some illustration. 
creating some separation of uh, also Pt Sharma Y Shinasana as well as some recurrent privilege situation. Recurrent privilege situation is actually more effective. For the other The other problem is that our research is poor. Another fact is though we are producing quality product, we are doing a lot with the research for the Microsoft for this company or that company and they are patently uh, with techniques and coming up with new products which are related at US product or UK product or France product or Germany product. What is in our country? How many such projects which we can claim that they have been covered by us and is very popular? Like Microsoft Windows. They are announcing nothing. Yeah. But lot of how we have got since we have a very high objective that we want to be a knowledge power government. We want to be a technology power government. We want to be innovator. What is it? Can it be reflected in the program educational objective? Yes. Apart from five or six program educational objective, that is a document. Nobody stops you that one of the objectives of this program is to prepare the graduate for teaching profession. It doesn't mean that everyone has to go into the teaching. It is not a hard and fast line that you are producing all the teachers. That will be one of the objectives. One of the objectives may even be that you want to groom the students so that they become very good researchers or innovators. Likewise, there are n number of things. You are producing chemical engineer. You can say, I want to produce a chemical engineer which may be best suited to the petroleum industry and the also chemical. That may be best suited to the food processing that also has some component of chemical. So likewise, I am a little bit. I don't know these things, but I am just citing some very, very uh, and say logical or illogical kind of the, uh, uh, examples just to take a point clarify that what program educational objective. The bottom line here is that program educational objectives must be documented so that the stakeholders for the program that part of the students and the parents they can get the benefit of it, they can make up their mind. There are hundred institutions offering the same program. The color and objective may be slightly different and they can align themselves, their interest, their inclination, their aptitude to a given program which may have the program objective that may suit to their, to their temperament, to their, to their attitude and to their interest. So these are the program educational objectives. How they have to be comprehended next, uh, well I will go to coming slides when I will uh, next is program outcomes. Outcomes and objectives, they should not be mixed. Objectives are why we have launched this program. Though the line is very thin, so I would like to spend some more time on to this issue. Line between program educational objectives and program outcomes is very thin. But they are different. Definitely they are different. Program educational objectives indicate why we have designed this program. To whom this program can be suited. I told you to that student and have an opportunity to decide whether to go to a mechanical engineering program of institute A, B, C, B, E or F. Some mechanical engineers, students may ultimately land up into the automobile or in designing certain structures. Some may be interested in designing of the machine. So that little difference can always be there. So that difference is to be illustrated in the <coughs> educational objective of a given program. Coming to the program outcomes. Program outcomes may narrate what are the expected 
qualities of the graduate once he or she passes through the entire courses of the program. This is theoretical. Expectations, speculations, imaginations of the people, of those eminent scholars, professors who have designed the program. That what way the student will move ultimately after four years, what qualities, what competencies, what skills he or she will have. They are the outcomes. Objective, why we are doing it. Outcomes, what we are expecting of it. Again, I will like to Objectives, why we are doing it. Why we have designed. And outcomes, what we are expecting. Once a student will go through this program, what we are expecting? What can he do out of it? And how to arrive at program outcomes? Again, when we move further, we we'll talk about it. I think I am clear of any, still if there is any doubt, I would like to make some more attempt. I myself is offering it. Because it's very, it is very thin line is between these two. And uh, I have to receive a lot of queries from the people to clarify these PEOs and PEOs. Well, you can keep it with you and we will uh, take it in the last discussions. The program curriculum, there is nothing great into it, which I need to explain. Everyone you have the course and curriculum and syllabus or papers, what you have to do is simply need to append it to the uh, SAR. Then, mapping between vision and mission. Graduate attributes, PUs. I will go later on first, vision and mission. Now we have three things. The vision of the institution, mission of the institution, mission of the department, program educational objectives, and expected outcomes. The common sense will say they should not be at variance if they have been designed, defined, articulated in a perfect manner. No person will say that the vision and mission should differ. If mission is like this, vision is like going this and people will say you don't know what you are supposed to do. The officers are not clear where you want to go. Likewise, the mission of the department should contribute, should help the institution, should help the governing body of the institution in achieving the mission of the institution. Department should not go out of the box that your ultimate institution want to achieve something and you are working in a different direction. So though it doesn't have any much impact, but it has some sense that there should be a correlation. They should be complementary to each other. That is the only, you can say, requirement of the international activity agencies. Just to make a sense that how serious an institution is in delivering, executing their programs. And nothing, nothing more serious or nothing more important other than that issue is. Likewise, graduate attributes and EUs. This is important. The program educational objectives and the graduate attributes should synchronize. They should not be at variance. What are the graduate attributes? I talked about when uh, in, the, in the forenoon session. So objectives should not be at variance than graduate attributes. If they are at variance, then what will happen? In the beginning, you will say the program may not pass through accreditation process. Because program is not designed to achieve the graduate attributes. So that's why it is written over here. The bottom line is internationally that these are the parameters which are essentials to be achieved 
if the program is to be accredited it is a sort of i am not saying is it is a sort of mandatory requirement to get a program accredited the students passing out of that program should have those qualities which are identified as graduate attribute by the washington accord community otherwise they will say okay you have your different thing you are not going to jail with us why should we go we are not forcing you to come in if you want to join our club is like this and i think most of us may agree that whatever they are talking about in graduate attribute that makes sense they are not that kind of the thing which uh, we say no this is this is all rubbish so this is the requirement and since graduate attribute is a mandatory sort of requirement so we all may agree that the program educational objective should be in line with the graduate attributes likewise program outcomes i will in the coming slides you will say outcome graduate attributes are also outcomes then where is the question of program outcomes they are different but split is same how will come later on when we'll talk about how to write the program educational objective how to develop the program and how to write the program outcomes then it, another important thing is program specific criteria so this is here i just want to request you to search for another document which may be in your folder uh, and at the top of page it is written a bit in the meantime please allow me to take a sip of some hot water maybe having a document with you written a bit at the front page yes sir yes sir this is the one if you turn pages then you will find some narrations it says program specific criteria and it is in two paragraph and there is n number of program specific criteria different uh, belonging to different disciplines hmm? just okay okay it is there na no? yeah page 6 is there no sir this is the uc berkeley document anyway i'll have you send if you can if someone can uh, give me his copy i'll be grateful to him if you can kindly give me i will narrate certain things speak out something and i will make sure that you got your copy no sir this one this is not the one he has the right one sir the right one this one so those who have the document i request them to kindly turn on to page 6 it says after first paragraph program criteria for aerospace and similarly named engineering programs and this has been developed by american institute of aeronautics and astronautics this is a professional body in the field of aeronautical engineering and the members are working professionals as well as the faculty members so out of their practical experience in the field out of their teaching and research experience they have prescribed this criteria and the criteria has two sub heading one is curriculum and the other is the faculty in curriculum it says aeronautical engineering programs must prepare graduates to have a knowledge of aerodynamics aerospace materials structures propulsion flight mechanics and stability and control 
astronautical engineering programs must prepare graduates to have a knowledge of orbital mechanics, space environment, attitude, determination and control, telecommunications, space structures and rocket propulsion. Aerospace engineering programs or other engineering programs combining aeronautical engineering and astronautical engineering must prepare graduates to have knowledge covering one of the areas aeronautical engineering or astronautical engineering as described above and in addition knowledge of some topics from the area not emphasized. Programs must also prepare graduates to have design competence that includes integration of aeronautical and astronautical topics. It may be appreciated from these contents, there is nothing related into it. They have just touched about the very, very essential topics of aeronautical and aerospace engineering. Nothing is special into that. A lot of flexibility has been given. It doesn't impose that you must incorporate this and that. But what does it say? That the graduate, the program should be or the curriculum should be so developed that at least these things must be incorporated. So this is called as program specific criteria. Once I will talk further then you will uh, understand the more relevance of these things. Another point they say about faculty. Program faculty must have responsibility and sufficient authority to define, revise, implement and achieve program objectives. The program must demonstrate that faculty teaching upper division courses have an understanding of current professional practice in the aerospace industry. You can see that this program criteria established by an American professional society prescribed very flexible quality in the faculty. It's not saying you must have PhD, you must have n number of paper, you must have this citation index. What they say that these are the essential, I'm not saying they say don't have PhD, no. It should not be construed that they are saying you should not have those characteristics. What they are saying, these should be the bare minimum things. At least faculty should be competent to do these functions. So reading these point one and two together, they form program criteria. It has certain relevance which we'll understand in uh, subsequent slides. So why I said this thing, I referred to this, I just want to make it a point that these things were missing with the accreditation system and parameter which is in practice today. They are very much relevant, you can appreciate. If you really want the outcome of a program, these are relevant. They, you can, no one can say they are irrelevant. They are not that rigid. Sir, can I, can I give it back? Sir, I will, I have already requested my people that they should uh, get more copies and or I will do one thing, this is already available with NBA in soft form, I will ask them to circulate a paper and you write your email ID because this is the campus of DTU, I don't know whether they have CD. Okay, so you might have got a CD by them, so this should be in CD. Okay, sir, it is there. Professor uh, Moedin is telling me that every document which I am referring to is in CD in electronic form. And, and I must uh, thank him for his sensitivity towards environment. And all of us should thank him. He has saved a number of trees. We should give a big hand to him. Uh, well, so... Other things I don't want to touch because all of you are aware about that in the format. I only want to touch the changes. The essence and the spirit of these things you know. 
they have already been talked about, incorporated in the document and those who still want to go in detail, my three colleagues are sitting here, they may, they may uh, narrate that in detail. So they are all part of the earlier formats, they are all part of the May 11 document and other things. So these are some tables seeking some information, blah, blah, blah. I personally feel they doesn't uh, require to be debated in detail and length here. Continuous improvement, of course. Continuous improvement, I will touch up when I will talk about how to write POs and POs. Because continuous improvement was to be taken in different sense in the earlier accreditation process and parameter. Today, they are in a different sense. So, just to save the time, I will take this matter along with, uh, there you know, I have to touch this point again. So, just to save the time. So we, we talked about this all detail, program outcome, program specific criteria and other things. Well, this is an important slide for me. This is how to develop a program, courses and their educational objectives and outcomes. The standard prescribed procedure by the Washington Accord community is that in framing the course curricula, designing and developing the program, all the stakeholders must be consulted. Because the graduates we are, or when I say we means educational institutions, producing for the industry, for the research institution, and other stakeholders are also required to be consulted. The reason I am going to explain while I will pick up their name. With industry, industry is the main stakeholder. You are producing the manpower for them. We need to know that what is their requirement? What competencies do they require from the graduates? And these things will keep on changing. New machines, new technologies, new working environment, and, and so on. So their consultation with the industry is very essential. I will take a small pause here just to narrate a question which was raised in the meeting of NIC Council in IIT Delhi. I participated in that in a different way, so I didn't respond to that, but here I would like to respond. One director from one NIT, I don't know what is the name, he raised a question that if we want to in involve industry in development of the syllabus, industry will give all the feedback or requirement that particular industry is asking, required. And it's very true, he's very absolutely right. If you are talking to one industry, they will give the entire syllabus which will be suited to that industry and the consequence would be the graduate cannot be employed anywhere else. That point he has raised was very valid. But it doesn't mean you should not consult industry. You need not to consult one industry. Nobody stops you to consult 10 or 15 industry. And thereafter, their suggestions are with you. They are not the dictates. You are the faculty members. You have to develop the courses. And as far as it goes for development of course and program, you have better understanding and knowledge and experience than the industry. You need to take the input. You need to moderate it. And then you need to make sure that a balanced curriculum is developed so that the opportunity for employment to the students are wide. They are not narrow, they are not focused. Second, the alumni. Alumni also gives an important fee. They have studied in your campus. Now they are working somewhere out. So they can make a sense which program, which training, which course, which activity they found very useful. And they can also tell you what is missing. They could have been performed better if this activity could have been added, this program could have been added, this course could have been added. Again, it is a feed, it is not a dictate. 
you are at your own to take a decision whether to honor that or not by application of your mind, your expertise and your experience. Students, students should not be feel burdened of the course. Otherwise, they are going to lose the interest. So what they feel, how they want, how this thing, that is also important feed. Again, again and again I am saying that is only an input. What is output that you have to decide as per your wisdom and experience. Management, again important. When I say management, for government institution, it is their governing board. For private institution, this is the society which is managing the institution. To launch a program, to modify a program, to redesign a course, there is bound to be a financial implication. Whether that change you are proposing is going to be backed by mean of finances or not, if you are ignoring that factor, your program may not be implemented properly. You have designed an excellent program that may require some machine to be uh, put in a laboratory and that machine is costing too much. And that machine is very essential. Your management doesn't have the finances. So you have to look for other way. It is better to have a program which is more effective, yield more better results rather than have a program which is not that effective and which is not incorporating the, the most desired competencies into the graduates. Professional bodies, they can give you a feed about the current trends, future trends. This, profit, this thing which I narrated from the EBIT document is a requirement given by the professional body. That may help you in designing the course. Parent, faculty, of course, they are the supreme. They have to take a call on, the, uh, on the, all the suggestions. Then parents, data in future, this is... Uh, I will apologize for that. This is my incorporation. It's not written there. It's not there. What I see, what I feel, you take it or don't take it. I'm very honestly admitting this is my feed. Uh, now I feel that things are changing very fast. The economies are going through the bumping road. There is one sector which is growing. Suddenly as time comes, that goes down, other sectors come up. So the manpower employed in that particular sector is jobless. The job opportunity got created in other sector. So if you can have a research cell which can have a sense that the how economic trend would be in future, you can refine the courses and curriculum in such a way that with little knowledge, little training, little self-reading, little self-exposure, your graduates are not unemployable. They can leave from here, the other opportunity there, they can move smoothly, they can transit to the other sector. That can be an added advantage to the course which you are going to design. Data on future, data in trend, in development, in the profession is a more or less same kind of the thing. So what they recommend that all feed from in these sources, and these are all, uh, you can say, illustrative. They are not the final word. In your wisdom, if you feel some more is required, some more may be useful, that can be collected, and that can be placed. The summary of that can be placed before your committee that uh, looks into the course that is responsible for development of the syllabus, development of the program, structuring and restructuring. Then, whatever the views are there, you have to formulate that what should be the objective of this new program. Likewise, you can go for identification of designing courses with defined objectives, elective and core courses, courses to achieve these objectives. Now I am coming to the program outcomes. While defining the program outcomes, one has to keep three things in mind. Number one, what objectives you have defined over here. Number two, what are the graduate attributes. And number three is the program specific criteria that we have just read out for. If you see the document, there are program specific criteria 
for other programs also. Ultimately, you are developing a professional. They have to work for the professional bodies in one way or the other. So you have to make sure that their recommendations, their requirement should be adjusted in appropriate way. And you will appreciate that they are not saying something uh, which is totally irrelevant. They make sense. So while we are going for mapping of program educational objectives, program outcomes, and program specific criteria, these three things are going to be taken into consideration. Now one question people can say that program outcomes can be copied as the graduate attributes. Why to design our own program outcomes when we have to take into account the graduate attributes? Why don't you cut and paste? If you see the graduate attributes, they are very generic in nature. They can be made applicable to most of the undergraduate engineering program across the spectrum. They are not specific. They are not specific to mechanical engineering. They are not specific to electrical engineering. They are not specific to electronic engineering. They are not specific to computer engineering. So you have to make them specific considering what your objectives of the program are. You have to make them specific what the concerned professional society is demanding. So if you take these two things into consideration, take the yardstick of graduate attributes with little effort, very easily you can define the program outcomes. It's not a very, very difficult task at all. One more rider I would like to put here. These graduate attributes as on date NBA doesn't has. The whatever I sh showed you, this was another reason that why we could not go through with the tier 1 or tier 2 document. We are intending to adopt these graduate attributes. And I used to talk very plain and clear. I am defamed for that. So that's why I would like to mention also why. We do not have such strong professional bodies in our country who have prescribed, defined so meticulously the program criteria, program specific criteria. So since we are moving towards Washington Accord membership, it is better that if we can adopt the program criteria already specified by the American professional societies, which are very active in their own country, not only there, but in other countries also. All of you may be aware, IEEE has a presence everywhere, like that. So this we are intending. I am not saying we are adopted, we are intending to adopt that. Another important aspect which I would like to touch upon here is the continuous improvement. What we mean by continuous improvement? So if you see the A part, if you add one more thing in A part, rather two more thing in A part, that will guide you towards the continuous improvement. What are the two factors? One factor is a survey. Once your graduate is employed, they are out. You should not sit idle. After two years of their employment, or you can make a regular process, develop a questionnaire, throw it out to all the industry which recruit the graduates from your institution, take the feedback. In which area, how do they perform? And the questions can be framed, now it is easier, on the basis of the graduate attributes. These are the graduate attributes defined. Considering each and every graduate attribute, you can define, uh, sorry, frame a question, take the feedback. You will come to know how they are faring in field, where they are doing very good, where they are lacking. And add here. Take that into consideration here. You may feel the redefining, redesigning, fine-tuning of some of the courses. 
some of the component of your program, some of the module of your program. So that is the continuous improvement. You got a feedback. As per the feedback, some scope of improvement. And these graduate attribute will keep on changing. The requirement of industry will keep on changing. They cannot be status forever. So the scope of improvement will keep on coming always. And that is the scope of improvement we want should be narrated in the SAR. What mechanism you have in the institute for improving the course? It is going to address another cause of concern which has been expressed at various levels that in some of our universities the syllabus are outdated. Industry says the graduates are unemployable. When we are going to accommodate their feedback, redefine, fine tune our courses, that complaint will never come. Other aspect is to get the information on student learning outcome. This one source, other source is in-house source. That I will discuss when I will come on student learning outcome. Otherwise here I have to explain you first student learning outcome. The feedback once you are taking from the employer, it doesn't mean that you need to write that questionnaire only to the HR department. You can also devise a mechanism to have a communication with the fellow colleagues, with the mechanics, with the employee which your graduate is commanding. That will give you a feed about the communication. That may give you a feed about interpersonal relations. That may give you a feel about his etiquettes, how he is concerned to the societal issues. So all stakeholders you can consider while receiving the feed about the competencies, about the skills, about the behavior of your graduate and accordingly you can go for continuous improvement, taking various steps. That continuous improvement may not only require the designing or fine tuning of the course. There could be some other issues uh, associated with that as well. So this I think we all talk about, I talked about this. Now, little monotonous kind of the job, how to prepare SAR. We have already, sir we can, uh, we will we'll give you the entire copy, relax. You just uh, give your email ID to my colleagues over here and uh, they will make sure that it is being forwarded to you. And hopefully that may be available on our website by mid of October when we will be launching our website. So, if still you want, I am not stopping you, it's open. If you want, you can have it. Please don't take me otherwise. Just for your convenience, I said. Uh, we discussed already that how to arrive at POs. You have to list the POs. Likewise, you have to list the POs, program outcomes. How to arrive at, I already discussed with you. Then, this thing I already told you. Another, the last point, the last bullet I would like to say something, rather last two bullets. To address all the program outcomes, all the competencies which are required from a graduate, defined, you need to develop some modular courses, you need to develop some activities, you may need to develop some syllabus. So that is required to be mapped with the outcome. That is the basic requirement. Second is, every course for the purpose of mapping, for the purpose of, you can say, for the convenience of self-assessment, every activity, every course should be defined with the objective. Like we talked about the program education objective, which is broad from the top. The program is composed of n number of the courses, M number of the activities, Y number of the laboratories and other. So for every, each and every course, each and every activity, it is required to define the objective. Why you are thinking that this course should be taken by your student? If the student takes this course, what competency he is expected to get? These are all speculations. 
it's not a reality, it's a theoretical. What you feel that if a student will go through this course, to go through this activity, go through this module, after successfully completing that thing, what he will gain? What skill, what ability he will achieve? List it out. That is called course outcome or course educational objectives. That has also to be defined. Now you can appreciate how dense documentation is needed in this process and how logical this process of accreditation is and how different this process of accreditation is. We are just halfway. Still half we have to cover. And course content, syllabus mapping of course content, yeah, syllabus. Here I am using syllabus for the affiliated institutions. They have to follow the syllabus of uh, the university. That's why I am using the word syllabus. And uh, most of our NITs and autonomous institutions, they have switched over to the course kind of the mechanism. Here I have written 1 to 12 of NBA. 1 to 12 of NBA are nothing but the graduate attributes adopted by NBA. They are the graduate attributes which are specified by the Washington Accord. Since in our document, they are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like 12. So I am using 1 to 12. Somewhere, some of the presenters may write A to K. A to K are the graduate attributes of EBIT. So in the EBIT document, they have listed A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So people are using A to K. In NBA document, we have listed number Y. So I am using the word 1 to 12. And this, the last bullet also we discussed about that it should conform to the program specific criteria. It should conform to PUs and PO. Now, how to prepare SAR? Earlier, I talked about what are the components of SAR in part A and part B. Now, I'll say how to write it. A statement about various infrastructure facilities, resource systems and practices of the institution that contribute towards achievement of PEOs and PO need to be reflected in SAR. Where it will fit in? It will fit in on a brief statement about the institute. Now those who are having a copy of the UC Berkeley, they can look at it. Can I have a one copy for my reference? Anyway, okay, I will try to, I will try to manage with that anyway. So, this is to be incorporated by and large. It's not a hard and fast. Whatever are here in these slides, they are just illustrative. And to further elaborate on this illustration, I have made available you with a copy of the self-study report of the University of California, Berkeley, of the two programs. So it's not possible uh, for me to touch upon each and every point. So uh, that's there for you can go. I just go through the split of that. So in the statement, this will go about then, mention about the evaluation and measurement tools, direct and indirect. Those have been used by the institute to assess that the course outcomes, programs, educational objectives and program outcomes are achieved. This second bullet needs more time to explain the assessment tools. And uh, I think it is better if I discuss that at the time of evaluation of SAR. So let us say, here we can, you can go back, what assessment tools are, which assessment tool is to be used and how the mapping is to be there. Because while writing the SAR, I just told you, this is a self-assessment report, same exercise is to be done by the institute and it is to be validated by the expert. So by that time, I'll have a little more relief to my throat. I will explain that, what assessment tool and how that to be used. Then write up about the university institute department. You have to give a write up about the department also. You have to give a write up about finance and the student's profile and vision, industry linkage, governance, academic policies and program structure, designing, faculty interaction and continuous improvement. So this would be a sort of summary sheet for the SAR, which I discussed while we say part A of SAR should have these three components. So these things should be covered and how it should be covered, a document of UC Berkeley is with you. You can very well make it out of that.
thereafter here these bullets say what should be the essentials of SAR they should have course content syllabus contribute towards attainment of PEOs program outcomes and 1 to 12 that is graduate attributes adopted by NBA program specific criteria through mapping efforts are made for continuous improvement you have to exhibit that you are making continuous uh, efforts to for further improvement various infrastructure facilities resource systems and practices of the institution contribute towards achievement of PEOs POs need to be reflected in SAR that may be better in form of a statement that what practices the institution is using to achieve the program educational objectives and for the attainment of the defined program outcomes. Evaluation and measurement tools, direct and indirect, have been used by the institute to assess the course outcomes, program educational objectives that I promise we will take in the, in the next presentation. These are nothing, the, you will get, uh, you know, this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So, these are simple instructions that how that should be there. And uh, for the benefit of the institutions who are intending to file SAR, by mid of October, our system to file SAR online would be in operation. And SAR needs to be uploaded onto the system in two folders. The one folder, only SAR is need to be uploaded. In the second folder, the bulky documents are to be uploaded. You need to upload some appendix and other things that we don't want that that should upload it in the folder of SAR. And the reason behind that is we also want to go like Professor Moini Dun is going to save paper entries. So when SAR would be sent to the evaluator, that will be sent online and will stop the practice of sending the SAR uh, 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 the hard copy of SAR. So if the entire SAR we want to send through internet, it will be very bulky document and lot of problems uh, one can envisage and foresee. <coughs> the evaluator and the chairman can think that whatever they are claiming as appendix is right, however they have an opportunity to verify the same thing when they are going for site visit. For their own self-study, they can, they can study that online. So that is the reason we have requested the institution to upload the SAR in two forms. One only SAR and other the annexion and the appendix. The same thing, original documents, publication, etc. This is redundant when you are going to file SAR online. In the second part of the talk, I will deliberate upon how to evaluate. That I would like to mix how to go for self-assessment as well as evaluation because evaluation is nothing but the revalidation of the self-assessment. So now I invite the question from you people. So it's a good question and I was during lunch time discussing this. Uh, we are, I feel, doing injustice to the student in the present system. We used to give the accreditation from the date EC or the NBA takes a decision for three year or five year. Quite often it happens that accreditation expire in the mid of the session. Then there may be some delay on part of the institution or on part of the uh, NBA that accreditation is not continuous. For a, that interval period, those who are graduating without any fault of them, their degrees are not acceptable. So what we are thinking upon that let us ask the institution to apply one year in advance and we are thinking to have a cycle for application. Any institution which will apply from 1st of April to the 31st of March, all those applications will be taken up in the next academic year. That is from 1st April to coming 31st March. So we would like to make sure that the decisions are communicated in the month of February or so, all the decisions. So and the NBA has already decided that the uh, accreditation would be communicated academic year wise in the interest of the students. So I have a question. Sir, uh, these slips are with me. If you permit me, let me finish up them, then I will come to you. Professor Kothari is asking when would you 
be implementing this new format as soon as possible, sir. My target is in next a month or so. But you know, I cannot guarantee like anybody else. Next question is from Professor Rajiv Kapoor. Keeping student performance past year will uh, dilute the academic quality. This should not be considered as an absolute number. I could not get this question. Keeping student performance uh, will dilute. Uh, can you please elaborate on to this question? Professor Kapoor? Anyway. I think what, whatever I could understand, I would like to reply to that. Student performance will dilute the academic quality, keeping student performance. You see, students' performance measurement tools are different. If you are considering the pass percentage or the mark the percentage or the grades he has achieved, I think this question is not relevant to the present system. Now we are looking into the attainment of the outcomes, not into the past percentage or how much uh, score he has got, how great he has got. Next is uh, Dr. Tandon. I feel a point has been missed that POs relate to point of graduation, that is at the end of four years from their entry into course, whereas POs are related to the point three to five years. No, sir, it's not the case. PEOs and POs are entirely different. PEOs are the objectives with which a program has been designed. And POs are the outcomes. Once a student graduated through the program, what competency he is supposed to attain? That is program outcomes. I think, uh, uh, as far as you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, you are confusing it with SLOs and POs. POs are measured after seven years or six years, whereas SLOs are measured instantaneously. In next presentation, I'm going to touch upon that. Professor K.R. Niazi, if today we formulate PO, how we are going to evaluate it for BTEC at the end of this year. Sir, PEOs will remain valid till you don't revise them. If you don't revise them for 10 years, they will remain valid for 10 years. They are the objectives. Keeping that in mind, you have designed a program. Professor C.M. Aroda, if the affiliating university is not describing the objectives and outcome of a course, then the affiliate college should prepare it or not. It's a very good question. They can always go for extra non-credit courses. Means the result of those courses may not reflect in their mark sheet. Nobody stops the college to give a certificate that look this student has passed out this course which was designed to attain such and such competency that is the course outcome. So in that way they can always go for value addition to the course which a university or to the program which a university has launched and prescribed. And as far as my knowledge goes a number of the colleges are doing value addition to the courses. In that way they will learn how to define the outcomes and how to define the objectives. The lastly, Professor Chakravarti, explain why POs and POs are generally different. Sir, I am repeating for the third time. PEOs are the objectives and outcomes are the competencies. I think the most general way is to explain that objectives and competencies. That is the last thing which I can say. What I am competent to do what cannot be considered as the objective. I may like to launch a program to prepare the teachers. That is my objective. But competency 
is that once student will graduate out of the program, he will be able to teach effectively. His communication skills will be superb. He will be able to or she will be able to contribute to the domain of knowledge. He will be competent enough to design new courses. So these are the competencies. And objective is the program has been designed to prepare the teachers. So I think now Sir, I will come to me. Let me finish the slips in my hand. I will like to respond to each and every person. The next is Professor Manji. I am sorry, sir. I cannot take up this question because it doesn't pertain to this workshop. This is an administrative issue. If you want, uh, you can talk to me later on. The question is, course outcomes may be the same for some courses. Answer is yes. A single course. Hello, sir. The question is, uh, suppose uh, for a particular program, I am writing the course outcome, uh, course outcomes. It will be the same for the different institutes for the same program for the same course? No, sir. Program outcome. Say there are 15. I am asking about the course outcome, not the program. I am coming, I am coming to that, sir. For course outcome, I think uh, you please better uh, uh, wait for the next presentation. Okay. That will, okay. that will save the time and I think uh, you will appreciate it in a better way. Yes, sir. The supporting what you are saying, clarifying slightly. Let us take for civil engineering. Although I am electrical engineering, but let's say for civil engineer, we have to write uh, uh, the PO and PO. As regards PO is concerned, we can say that the students who will be undergoing the program, degree program in civil engineering, they will be uh, employed in these, these areas and they will be performing these, these uh, broad uh, activities. One. Second can be that the course aims at developing these, these competencies in the students. Third can be that the, the POE can be that the, we are preparing a licensed civil engineer. The, another course uh, PO can be that we are developing leadership and management skills in our students in the degree in civil engineering so that they can manage the students. Then we can say we are developing, as another PO can be, we are developing students who are lifelong learners, who can, uh, uh, you know, learn new things and they can uh, go for higher education. These can be the POs. As regards PO is concerned, as... Uh, uh, have been said that uh, it will be based on the knowledge I and K and the knowledge attributes. This can be, one can be that they should be able to apply mathematics, physics, chemistry, etc. in the applications in civil engineering. There can be, they should be able to yes, investigate and uh, solve the problems related to civil engineering. Then we can have the technical outcomes also which are related to projects, systems, processes, etc., which is expected that the students will acquire competencies through the various courses they will go through. Then we will have that they should have uh, good communication, they should have a humanistic approach to life, they can take into account the uh, contextual and environmental and social uh, uh, requirement in the projects which they are executing. This is just uh, to support you, sir. Uh, to some extent, uh, 
I agree with you, but with one comment that outcomes are required to be in line with the graduate attributes. So they could be considered as a guideline for framing of the outcomes. And an adequate care may be taken that they are not copied as educational objectives. Another thing which I can recommend from here that for those institutions who are new, who are not uh, in a position to appreciate in a big way or in a real way, they can also go to the website of some very renowned and uh, well-known universities and can browse through the bulletin, undergraduate bulletin of those universities. So that will also help them that how to write the PEOs and how to write the program outcomes. The syllabus professor A.K. Roy and J.R.P. Gupta, 15-20 industries may be consulted to collect data uh, request to the requirement of industries for the collected data would be no sir actually first thing is NBA doesn't have any central mechanism to do that sir NBA's job is just to revalidate the assessment of the institution NBA can pass on the information which it collects and receives from different angles. It is the job of the faculty. So we are the babus. We are not the academicians to help you like that. Rather, we are running our business with your help. So I think it is not fair for you people to ask the NBA to do the academic activities. Rather, we are looking at you to help us in academic activities. Professor Suri, how will the NBA system address the largely mismatch between PEOs and available job opportunities? The NBA system, if you give a rethought to it, is basically the program outcome system and the graduate attribute is for bridging the gap between the requirement by the industry and our graduates. It is there. These graduate attributes have been defined in consultation with the industry. The question is about the NBA will have international equivalence. I just want to dispel the doubt from the minds that as on today, if you are getting the NBA's accreditation, it is not to be considered as international accreditation. Once NBA will become a permanent signatory of the Washington Accord, thereafter any accreditation would be considered equivalent to the accreditation by the members of the Washington Accord. We are moving towards that. That's why we are working hard. So if something is in your mind that today we are coming with, with tier 1 document, if it is going to be Accredited, then you got international accreditation. That is not the case, sir. Then what are the criteria for the measurement of student performance? That is in my second part of presentation. Are the graduate attribute given equal weightage? Sir, there is no question of giving weightage to the graduate attribute. What is there if you will uh, come across my next presentation? It is required that all the graduate attribute must be covered. I think uh, you will appreciate it better once we will come for the next second part of uh, this uh, presentation. I think, sir, uh, can we talk about over tea? The people are looking for tea. Half of the people have gone out. Sir, NBA doesn't believe in regulation. NBA believe in the growth of the wisdom and growth of the wisdom can only be when you just give them the free hand, okay, develop your own POs and POs. But if you want our accreditation, 
they should be in line with the defined graduate attributes. And if you don't want, well, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. So, on behalf of DTU, I would like to invite for a cup of tea in the lobby. Welcome back after the tea session. Are you ready for the next session? So, I would like to take your consent. Should I continue with my second part of presentation or should I ask uh, my colleague here to give presentation? I have two more. One on the mapping of the assessment of outcomes, significance of mapping of assessment outcomes. And the other is exclusively for evaluators. That is, the two more presentations are there and the time is short. At the most, we can cover with one. So the choice is yours, whether you want me to continue or you want that my colleague, as per the schedule, can go ahead there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Atma Ramji, if you could kindly see if some uh, professors are outside, if they can come back. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity today. In this part of presentation, we or I would like to cover that how the self-assessment report is assessed. Though it is a very weird statement which I made, self-assessment, assessment of self-assessment report. Doesn't make any sense. What I mean to say is, the data collected and compiled in a given format, how that data is assessed to arrive at a conclusion whether the program is strong enough to deserve accreditation or it is not and if not where are the weaknesses and how to improve that. So in this self-assessment process we have just talked about that what information we are supposed to gather to put into a format and now the focus of this presentation and talk is how to assess that information. Again, I am not going to touch the assessment of all the information. I am going to leave that information which used to be assessed as per the old system. The formats, the points and marking. I am just touching the hardcore matter that is the program educational objectives program outcomes, graduate attributes, course educational objective, course outcomes and uh, student learning outcomes. Before moving forward, I would like to explain few terms. The terms are course educational objectives, course outcomes, student learning outcomes and assessment tools. It is very important to talk about assessment tools once we are talking about the assessment. Taking a, picking up a thread, thread from the earlier presentation, we said designing of the program. Then we also talked about the courses, modules and activities that constitute a program. And I also talked about that every course which is a constituent of a program and every activity, every module needs to have an objective or two objectives or three objectives. So institutes are supposed to identify the objectives for every course. Likewise, they have to identify or articulate the outcomes for each and every course and each and every activity. In the similar fashion as we talked about the listing of program educational objectives. Likewise, we have to say this course has been designed for this purpose with this objective. Purpose and objective are quite close and what 
competencies are expected to be attained by the students on successful completion of that activity or on successful completion of that course are the course outcomes or activity outcomes they are also required to be defined the next term is slo slo stands for student learning outcome student learning outcome is what student has learned after completion of that program sorry course at different level you are all aware that you administer the test on students at the end of the semester at the end of first month or second month or trimester trimester or half yearly or annually depending upon the pattern of instruction and examination prevailing in the concerned institution so how to document it how to assess it and the assessment of that cannot be by a single method that's why i referred to the term assessment tools not assessment tool assessment tools you will say i am crazy i am not you may have to deploy a number of assessment tools to assess the outcome whether they have been achieved course outcome through student learning outcomes i will request you to refer to a two page document given in your folder and it is written over that courtesy engineers australia and the first page is having a table in that table you will find six tools listed with number 1 2 3 4 5 6 <laughs> these are the assessment tools which are usually deployed to assess the competency attained by a student this is the examination assignments projects tutorials labs presentation and that is not the end they are just illustrative and some more may be added as per your wisdom and as per your experience they are nothing new to you i know it very well but its significance and its applicability that matters and before i come to the significance and applicability of these tools i would like to touch upon one more point and that point is the assessment of program outcomes and assessment of course outcomes or student learning outcomes student learning outcome is a very generic terms a student learning outcome can be related to a course which he or she has successfully completed or has gone through an activity or a program as a whole you have defined program outcomes you have defined course outcomes it is very essential to assess the strength of the program that whether these outcomes which we have articulated which we have identified have been achieved or not only then we can say the program is strong or not because the identification of program outcomes has some yardsticks that is peos graduate attributes and program specific criteria but up to what extent they have been achieved it is important that will give an indication about the strength of the program so how to assess it we usually say there are two tools which are broadly deployed or you can say the all tools which are used can be classified into two one is the direct tools and the other is the indirect tools the direct tools are in front of you these six 
illustrative and many more possible the indirect tools are generally used to assess the program outcomes i referred to surveys while i was talking about formulation of the program educational objective designing the course curriculum and program then i said the input from the industry alumni through surveys so the survey is an indirect tool and that gives a reflection on the accomplishment or attainment of program outcomes but this is only possible at least 6 7 years from the date the program was launched you design a program launch the program it takes 4 years to come out the first batch then they are in the field and before giving a report honest and authentic report you need to give some time to the employer and those who are involved in the survey to make an observation of your object your object is your graduates employed there or in interaction with someone only then they can make a meaningful assessment without that they cannot do that so the program outcome can only be known after 6 or 7 years i will say 7 years because 2 year time you have given then the survey then the collection of the data of survey then the analysis and only then you will have a reflection on the attainment of program outcomes but if there is a new program it comes for accreditation after 6 years you may not have that data ready you may not have the opportunity for continuous improvement because that survey is not available with you in that circumstances this is the student learning outcome for the courses they have undergone and for a cluster of courses or for a set of courses and activities that matters and to assess those outcomes we are talking about these six tools to further appreciate the applicability of these tools i will request you to turn to the next page this table has a list of the courses in the first column no it is not on the slide sir it's because it's a so fine print it won't be possible to read from the slide i'll give you my copy no issue if one can get benefit you give your copy to someone in the first column it has listed out all the courses all the component of the program their course are also there and on the top column they have listed out the objectives of the various courses and it is abbreviated as peo1 peo2 because it's australian thing otherwise it should have been ceo1 ceo2 course educational objective 1 or 2 every country everything they have their own terminology and own way of this but we have to catch the spirit of that so first column list out the courses second column list out the out outcomes or the objectives in my opinion it should list out the outcomes objectives are not going to serve the purpose to that extent as the outcomes will do thereafter you might have seen there are numbers written in the in the columns and in the in the rows 1 2 1 2 3 1 4 1 6 1 6 2 again i would like to explain for the benefit of those who do not have it at one axis you are having the courses on other axis you are having the course outcomes or outcomes of the activities as defined by the program for the program and in between that there you will find some numbers these numbers correspond to the tool if it is number 1 it is the tool in the table on the first page number 1 tool if it is says 1 6 it means to assess this competency the tool number 1 and tool number 6 both are used if it is 1 3 5 
it means in the assessment of this competency for this course the tool number 1 3 and 5 they have been used i know sir i apologize for that sir this is something goof up by my people but i own the responsibility i am sorry for that the copy which i have i already given i don't have any more it's it's inconvenient to me also i have to use <laughs> my memory to explain it so this matrix is supposed to be prepared by the institution that to assess an outcome for a given course which assessment tool has been used and the evaluator will revalidate it whether they have selected the right tool or not so this is another complexity involved in the assessment of the achievement of program outcomes or the course outcomes so now you can appreciate how scientific and logical this method is it is not simply saying that they have achieved which tool has been deployed for which outcome and for which course that has to be given and in the document which we are developing another information is to be given in another table that this is the course and what is the percentage of attainment for example there is a course in mathematics you have deployed the examination tool how many students have attained 60% marks 70% marks 80% marks 90% marks and above so that will give an indication about the delivery system of the course up to what extent the defined course outcome was attained by the students and if you map this data with the quality of students who have taken that course the reflection will be much more stronger so such kind of the tools are used for self assessment here the outcome of these tools will enable the institution to decide upon fine tuning of the courses and that can also be reported as an activity for continuous improvement you designed a course with a specific purpose with a defined outcomes and if the assessment results indicate that the course is not effective in achieving the outcomes so it is an opportunity to the faculty who designed that course to relook into the issue find out where went where was wrong at what was wrong and from next academic year to improve upon that course so this is a mechanism of continuous improvement which is required to be reflected and which is required to be claimed that the institution is for continuous improvement this is not the only addition of classrooms creation of fac uh, facilities the result the pass percentage these are also improvement but they are input and output improvements since we are in the business of outcome based accreditation so improvements also need to be outcome improvements so in this way we are supposed to assess the achievement of the outcome of the courses and of the program and go for continuous improvement process through slos and using the direct tools indirect tools we have already discussed can you go back last slide okay next next slide next okay 
so this is a matrix again in this matrix you see the type of the course that is lec stands for lecture lab stands for lab likewise oth means other and this is the unit or the credit you can say then the course number and the title and a b c d up to n they are the outcomes outcomes which you have defined for a given program which is under accreditation which is under improvement thereafter you have to use your slo data and indicate here up to what extent this outcome has been achieved you see here three colors rather four shades the brown the light brown yellow and white the intensity of the color indicates the level of achievement or attainment of the program of outcome if it is white it means it has not contributed towards that particular outcome let me explain it again on one axis we are having the courses listed the other axis we are having the defined program outcomes and the level of attainment of the outcome is given here in color shades the intensity of the color signifies the level of attainment and you are having three or four shades here one is blank means no attainment there are three colors one is dark highest degree of attainment dark brown sorry light brown medium level of attainment yellow lower level of attainment and white no attainment so this matrix will also give you an indication that which program is contributing to what extent towards the attainment of the listed program outcomes what the bottom line here is that may fail a program that any of the listed program outcome right from top to the down should not be white some other other uh, uh, slides are also there for that if for example d if d is white down to the line below it means none of the course has contributed towards attainment of e outcome so that is missing program failed the level may different the evaluators while writing the report can say these are the weaknesses and in our opinion institutions need to work harder to attain this program outcome depending upon that intensity of the color the level of attainment and the level of attainment how you will come i told you we are going for another table wherein we are going to list the programs sorry courses and then the number of the students who have attained 50% marks 60% marks 70% marks 80% marks 90% marks and more so how many students have attained more marks will given reflection to the level of attainment of that outcome if most student have scored less than 50% or 50% or 60% you can say attainment is very poor if most of the students have attained more than 80% marks you can say att attainment is good 70% marks maximum students more than 50 60% then you can say the attainment is moderate and the level of attainment may be low or high on a number of factors the factors could be the program may be so tough that the level of input of the students is not right enough to absorb that the content of that program the delivery may not be right the program may be totally out of context may not be appreciable by the student and this is not for us this is for the faculty to analyze that what went wrong 
with the course that the attainment levels are not good. So that analysis will provide an opportunity for the improvement, for making some improvement in that course and making the correction. That again contribute towards the continuous improvement. So in that way, we need to map the attainment of the course outcomes and when you sum up through this table, the others are also there, please pick up. Keep on, keep on going, keep on going like this. So the entire courses which a student is to take during the course, entire activities, you will have to list out here. So this is a very wonderful matrix. It gives you two, three senses. Number one, the strength of a course, the level of attainment of the outcomes. Three, this third one is that which attainment, sorry, which outcome has been atta attained and which is missing. So maximum information one can get from here about the strength of the program. But for developing this matrix, you need to take into consideration the SLOs and the number of the students who have scored more than 50, 60, 70 and 80 percent marks. That analysis you have to do. This matrix has to be developed for two. Number one, for the program outcomes, the institution or the department has fixed listed out and number two for the purpose of NBA the graduate attributes which NBA has specified for the accreditation of the program. There may be two different things. Another important point here is that, a, that you can see from this matrix that one course may contribute towards the attainment of more than one outcome. A course may not contribute to the attainment of two different outcomes. It is not necessary that a single course will contribute towards attainment of one outcome only. And it's very, very simple to understand because there are only 12 outcomes or 15 outcomes and the number of the courses are more than that. So bound to be one course is contributing towards attainment of more than one outcome. So this exercise we call mapping for assessment of the attainment of program outcomes and graduate outcomes. The factors which are used for that is a student learning outcome. One exercise a that institution has to do which award grades, which doesn't award the percentage. The table which I was referring to is not here. We are intending to make that this course, how many students have got more than 60, more than 70. So you have to convert those grades into the percentage. Because grades are quite broad. So if you really want to analyze in a more precise manner, the attainment of uh, outcomes, I think, it is desirable to convert the grades into percentage and then to come up with sort of conclusion that what is the level of attainment of that particular outcome. So this is all about the mapping of attainment of program educational object, sorry, outcomes. Well, Now two, three things are left here, which are very minor things. The next is quite lengthy, which I will take tomorrow. Here mapping is needed. The mapping of vision and mission we talked about. Mapping of the mission of the department to the mission of the institution we have talked about. The mapping of the program educational objectives to the program outcomes. It is also very important. 
the objectives should not be totally out of place of the defined outcomes. They should be aligned. That's why I used to say again and again and again, there is a very thin line drawn between educational objectives and outcomes. Very thin line. Third thing important is the mapping of the program of outcomes with the graduate attributes. The assessment or the assessor has to make sure that the program outcome that has been defined are in consonance with the graduate attribute prescribed by NBA. It has to be doubly sure that none of the graduate attribute, none of the component of the graduate attribute is missing from the program. It is for the evaluators to see. It is not for the college, it is for the evaluators to see. And college has to see it at the time of, at the time of developing the program. Then the mapping of courses to the program outcomes, this matrix. This matrix is serving number of purposes. It is mapping the courses with the outcomes. It is mapping the outcome to the attainment level. And the similar matrix is also mapping the outcome with the graduate attributes. So this is the crux, this is the essence, this is the soul of output based accreditation, sorry, I'm sorry, outcome based accreditation. I think uh, now you can, uh, you will be in a better position to appreciate the difference between the earlier system and present system. So this is the end of the assessment of the SAR limited to the new items. The old items I am not touching because all of you are quite familiar with that. The other criteria of NBA, the student performance, this and that, you are already doing that through the information which is provided in the table form and in this new document also certain points have been awarded, a methodology has been given that how those points are to be awarded. The attempt has been made to reduce the subjectivity to the lowest level. So that we can give a fair treatment to each and every institution and if the institution is going in appeal, they are also having adequate proof in their hand that look, this is my evidence, the marks have been awarded like this, so I, I claim that the awards are wrong, so the appellate committee can look into that issue. Likewise here also, once we are asking for the table that how many students have achieved, how much percentage, so that is a basic to give you the color code and here also the discretion has reduced to certain extent. So the objective is to reduce the discretion, make the system more transparent and more objective in nature and to have a focus on the assessment and mapping of the outcomes vis-a-vis -vis the graduate attributes internationally accepted. Now I'm open for the question, please. The question is from Professor Sohi, Chandigarh. Institute University having a relative grading system cannot use percentage of the students. What alternative in the relative grading distribution of grades in natural distribution of grades? Sir, I will throw this question back to you. The purpose for having that percentage I have explained because we want to make it more subjective. My understanding is there, is there are certain formulae 
or certain methods to convert the grades into the percentage and percentage into the grade. If you can suggest something, that will be better. If it is impossible, then we can't help it. Then we have to reconsider to drop that table. Sir, uh, in relative grading, uh, the natural distribution of the grades is that whatever the number of grades are in A, that will be in the lower grade and almost equal distribution of these grades are there. Now, in case of percentages, it would have been easier to assess. But in this case, since they are relatively placed, I do not know how to uh, group them. Because I'm some of them will be there in uh, some category. Sir, I, in, I am in total agreement with you. But our objective is a little pious. We just want to reduce the element of subjectivity. So I will request all of you, if you can find out and give us some solution. And if there is no solution, we have to accommodate all the institutions. We cannot isolate them. Then we may have to rethink that. Should we continue with that table business or should we Sir, do away with that? There is a solution of this problem. Normally, as far as the clarity of delivery is concerned, if your average average grade cutoff is more than 60, it means your delivery is very good. This is simple method, sir. You take an average, then you grade, do grading. So see this uh, statistical average. If that statistical average is above 60, that means your delivery is very good. Uh, I will request you, if you could kindly oblige us by uh, giving uh, this thing in writing so that we can incorporate it for the convenience of all the assessors and evaluators. Sure, sir. Do that. Thanks. Thank you very much. The another, this question is from Professor Rizvi, AMU Aligarh, and he is asking whether the tier 1 manual supplied here is the final document. Answer is no, sir, because uh, I just narrated that we are working on to that and certain things which I made presentation is the essence of that new document which is coming up after incorporation of these new things. And these things you will not find in this document which is in your hand. So, uh, can I conclude this talk by making one more statement which I intend to do that though I am going to touch it tomorrow as well. Uh, the assessors and evaluators are also required to have a look on the question papers as well as answer sheets just to make sure whether the questions can dig out or can questions are uh, sufficiently framed or uh, adequately I should say adequately and framed uh, to assess that outcome. Even if you are asking to write exam to the student, the examination patterns are different, objective type, subjective type, essay type, then thought type. So what sort of questions are required to assess the attainment of a given uh, outcome? That is very, very important. So this is a new thing which uh, will come with this new system of accreditation. So we need to collect those question paper. We need to see and apply our experience and wisdom and then we need to comment and they, these documents need to be collected and submitted to NBA at the time of evaluation. So thank you very much sir for uh, very kind uh, patience hearing to me. Thanks a lot and I wish you a great evening ahead today and we'll meet tomorrow in the morning and I will conclude my presentation which is uh, devoted for evaluators exclusively and during that time I will also take few minutes to explain how our new NBA is going to work a special focus the relation of ENBA to the evaluators. ENBA is a portal uh, which we are having and uh, as an attempt to make the entire office of NBA paperless so that you can transact the business online. So we have given that ENBA name. Yes, sir. No, sir, not the answer script. The sample questions. No. 
so that that actually basically it is not for the purpose of uh, having any doubt on any evaluator we i am talking about from administrative point of view sometimes the college the, your decision is not going in for of college they are coming for appeal if they are contending on that point so we need some evidence to show them look this is the this is the case it is for the document which is coming up done sir it was before t no tell me what is that in the second session is about the mapping great criteria for measurement of students i discussed i told you to refer to the uh, document of engineers australia two pages then i talked about the table wherein there are listing of the programs on one side course objectives on the other side and the assessment tool that need to be deployed on uh, uh, between the two axes i explained it sir sir in indian scenario what will be the major criterions can you list one or two three just sir uh, give your email id and to mr rajendra who is next to you he will mail you my presentation the second presentation i think third slide that list out all the accreditation criteria to be used by nba for accreditation of a program sir i intend to complete our job by next week then i have to seek the comments of mentor i don't know how much time they are going to take then i have to take the document to my executive committee to give it legal authority so it's very difficult for me to uh, give it timeline to you sir till today the document in existence is may 2011 document i think that some more questions are coming up the question is from dr mehta from jodhpur it would be nice if soft copy of all the presentation is made available please give your email id to him and he will give it to you and uh, i am intending to have them on our website also once it is in operation okay sir thank you very much and i would not like to take more time of yours go and have a very nice evening ahead and hope to see you in the morning tomorrow bye